some years ago when I was in my fellowship uh, training in the Midwest at the Mayo Clinic, I took care of lots of hand and uh, wrist injuries, but they were in terrible industrial accidents and farmers who would uh, amputate their fingers or wrists. And now that I'm in Greenwich, I'm taking care of a different spectrum of injuries. And, uh, um, racket sports and golf um, are, um, do pose a, a real strain on the wrist and hand, however, and they pose a unique um, challenge for us in taking care of these injuries. So tennis, paddle, squash, racquetball, and golf all uh, have similar repetitive motions about the wrist that may predispose patients to injury, and the soft tissues and ligaments and stabilizers of the wrist absorb the impact uh, upon striking with, uh, say, a tennis racket or a golf club. Also, the racket or golf club handles can predispose patients to risk. So there are a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, pathomechanics at play with these sports. So I'm going to talk about three specific injuries. Wrist tendinitis, three specific types. I'm going to talk about something called a TFCC injury, or triangular fibrocartilage complex injury, and a somewhat rare injury that golfers and baseball players sometimes sustain called a hook of the hamate injury, or fracture. So wrist tendinitis, well, in racket sports and golf, there are three common types that are uh, frequently uh, affected, and these are something called intersection syndrome, extensor carpi ulnaris tendinitis, and de Quervain's tendinitis. And if you look at this diagram on the top right of the screen, the anatomy around the wrist and hand is incredibly complex, and there are lots of tendons which cross both the back and the front of the wrist. And, and tendinitis in general is any um, inflammation causing pain along a tendon, and many of these structures are at risk in the wrist in racket sports and golf. So overuse of any of these uh, muscle tendon units can predispose uh, a particular tendon unit to inflammation, pain, swelling, and dysfunction. So these three types, if you look at the lower diagram, de Quervain's uh, tendinitis is a tendinitis that general, generally affects the thumb side of the wrist. Intersection syndrome generally affects the back central part of the wrist, and extensor car carpi ulnaris, or ECU tendinitis, generally affects the pinky side of the wrist. So de Quervain's tenosynovitis, really common problem, common in athletes and non-athletes together. It's a tendinitis caused by inflammation and swelling of the tendons that are at the base of the thumb and wrist. And these are the abductor pollicis um, longus tendon, the tendon that uh, radially deviates the wrist, and the extensor pollicis brevis tendon, the tendon that extends the thumb uh, metacarpal. And uh, repetitive overuse of uh, the, this tendon group, it's called the first dorsal compartment, will cause inflammation, swelling, and uh, pain. And uh, studies have shown that repetitive overuse causes uh, swelling and thickness in the lining, the sheath of the tendon, that's up to five times greater than normal. And you get a deposition of dense uh, scar tissue, which causes friction, pain, and sort of a, a cycle uh, that's difficult to disrupt. This is common in racket sports, but also new, mo new mothers frequently get this type of tendonitis from picking up a new baby repetitively. The most common type of wrist tendonitis in uh, racket sports players is called intersection syndrome. And it's called intersection syndrome because it occurs at the intersection point where two tendon groups cross. And so if you look at the back of the wrist, about three centimeters proximal to the wrist joint, the tendons that extend the wrist, called the extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus, and those first dorsal compartment tendons that we talked about, they intersect. And in uh, racket ball players, rowers, weightlifters, skiers, repetitive overuse creates friction, inflammation, pain, and eventually, um, uh, if there's enough pain and problems, we end up seeing these patients in the office. The smooth gliding lining of these tendons um, starts to develop friction. One interesting thing about this type of tendonitis, if any of you have had it or you've had any friends that have had it, it will actually cause an audible sound when patients move their wrist. You'll hear a crackling or a popping or a squeaking when patients move their wrist. And it's a little bit disconcerting if, uh, you know, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't heard of this problem, which is a relatively benign problem. The last type of tendonitis is ECU tendonitis. This is also extremely common. It's the second most common tendonitis in the wrist in the athlete. And the ECU, or extensor carpi ulnaris tendon, is a tendon on the pinky side of the wrist. It extends and ulnarly deviates the wrist. So in daily, everyday life, there aren't a lot of times where we're frequently doing this motion. But tennis players most commonly have the wrist in extension and ulnar deviation. So this is a 
a type of tendonitis that's frequent from overuse in uh, tennis players or from poor technique. And again, repetitive microtrauma and motion causes this pain, inflammation, swelling, and dysfunction. The physical exam of these patients is there'll be pain on this ulnar side of the wrist. There's forced isometric supination causes pain. Often we'll verify the diagnosis with an MRI because there are lots of other causes of pain on the ulnar side of the wrist. And an MRI will show swelling and edema of the tendon. Occasionally, people with this type of tendonitis will have a dislocation of the tendon. The tendon will actually pop out of the groove and cause snapping and clicking, which causes further tendonitis. So fortunately, all three of these types of tendonitis in uh, racket sports uh, players are very easily treatable, and they're treatable the same way uh, with rest and mobilization. The difficult thing is uh, convincing ourselves and our patients not to play through this because it does get worse if you push through it. Anti-inflammatories are quite helpful. Modifying uh, the way you hold a racket can be important. And sometimes we'll consider a corticosteroid injection in the tendon compartment, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory that can stop the um, inflammatory process. Surgery is rarely needed for all three of these types of tendonitis, uh, but when we do consider surgery for refractory cases, we're generally releasing the tight connective tissue or the tight bands around these tendon linings. And on the bottom right picture, you can see a dequer veins operation. This is when we release the compartment of uh, tissues, the sheath that holds the first dorsal compartment tendons, and it's very effective, but fortunately, rarely needed. So the second type of injury I'm going to talk about is a TFCC tear. Now, what the heck is the TFCC? It's a complicated name, the triangular fibrocartilage complex. It's basically just a fancy name for a shock absorber and a stabilizer in the wrist. Most of us have, know about the meniscus in the knee. Well, the TFCC is sort of an analogous structure between the ulna bone and the carpal bones in the wrist. And there are two types of injuries um, that people will get. You can have an acute traumatic injury, and that's from a fall onto a hyperextended pronated wrist, like you can see on the figure on the top right, or it will often sustain chronic attritional ruptures from just everyday wear and tear. Patients will present with pain on the pinky side of the wrist. Sometimes they'll be clicking with form rotation, and depending on where the TFCC is torn, sometimes there'll be instability of the joint between the radius bone and the ulna, called the distal radial ulnar joint, or the DRUJ. So the TFCC is a, a complex structure that has a bunch of different components. There's a central articular disc. There are ligaments on the palm side and the back side called the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. Then there are ligaments that connect the ulna to the carpal bones. And lastly, there's a, a sheath called the ECU subsheath that's intimately involved in the TFCC. So the way we treat these injuries depends on what component of the TFCC is injured. But in general, again, the TFCC is both a stabilizer and a shock absorber of the wrist. The volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments are responsible for rotational stability of that distal radial ulnar joint, where that ulna bone connects to the uh, radius. Also, the TFCC is important to shock absorb the, the carpus. The TFCC increases the joint contact area between the radius and ulna and the carpal bones. So how, how other than physical exam, uh, how do we diagnose these injuries? Well, MRI is a crucial component to the diagnosis because, as I mentioned, there are a lot of causes of pain on the ulnar side of the wrist. Um, an MRI has a variable ability to detect uh, these injuries, which depends in part upon magnet strength, the use of a wrist coil, and what sequences we look at. But fortunately, we've become very good at diagnosing these injuries on MRI. And one trick we have is to inject a little bit of dye into the wrist before. It's called an MR arthrogram, and it greatly increases the sensitivity of this test. So how do we treat these injuries? Well, initially, uh, rest and immobilization especially for unstable injuries. We um, often treat patients in this splint that's on the top right. It's called a Munster splint, which allows for some elbow motion, but it prevents forearm motion. So it allows those ligaments to heal. As patients are progressing through treatment, sometimes we'll graduate them to a less cumbersome splint or brace, as you can see on the bottom right. Anti-inflammatories and corticosteroids are sometimes used for persistent pain. But when uh, patients uh, really aren't progressing and have either persistent pain or instability of the distal radial ulnar joint, we consider surgery. And today, this is usually done arthroscopically. Um, so arthroscopic surgery can be done to either clean up the edges or to repair the edges of the TFCC. And usually, we can do this through a few poke holes in the back of the wrist. Um, so you guys have seen a lot of 
knee and shoulder arthroscopy, well, wrist arthroscopy, the space in the wrist joints is really tiny. So we're using tiny cameras, tiny instruments, and this probe here is the size of a pencil. But this is uh, a patient of mine that has a clear TFCC tear. You can see the defect in that soft tissue and the bounciness of that TFCC tissue is compromised. It doesn't have that sort of trampoline tension that it normally should. And you can see a clear cleft here. So this was a patient that was arthroscopically treated. We clean off the uh, torn edges to a clean, healthy bleeding edge so that we can repair it. And in this case, uh, the repair is accomplished arthroscopically with some sutures that, report the, that uh, repair the torn edges back to their origin. So the last injury I'm going to talk about, it's a fairly uncommon one, but it's one that's unique to golf and sometimes baseball. It's a fracture to one of the little bones in the wrist called the hook of the hamate. So there are lots of tiny bones in the wrist, but the hook of the hamate, if you look at your own wrist, you can feel kind of a bump just on the ulnar side of the wrist, a little sort of point, and that's the, the, the palmar part of the hamate bone. It's, there's a little hook, and that bump is where when you hold a golf club or a baseball bat, the, the butt of the club or the bat rests against. And uh, patients who ground the club or sometimes if you hit a foul pitch bat, you can uh, fracture that hook of the hamate. And uh, the problem with these injuries is it has a low rate of healing because there's poor blood supply in this bone. Patients will present with pain and sometimes persistent numbness in the small finger because a branch of the ulnar nerve travels right by that hook of the hamate and it can cause pain and inflammation and impingement. We diagnose these injuries based on physical exam with tenderness on, the, on that uh, point on the wrist and also something called a hook of the handmade pull test. X-rays are notoriously poor at catching these injuries, so sometimes we'll have to obtain a CAT scan, which is the gold standard to diagnose these injuries. And if you look at the bottom right screen here, you can see that sort of beak of the handmade, that hook of the handmade is fractured. And uh, many of these injuries do fine with conservative treatment but they have to be immobilized, just like uh, many other fractures. So we generally cast patients for four to six weeks, um, and usually that will be sufficient to take care of the pain. But occasionally these bone fragments will not heal, again, because of the poor blood supply, and will have persistent pain and numbness. In these rare cases, we consider surgery to excise the non-healed fragment. Now you may ask, well, why excise the piece? Why not fix it like we do for other um, broken bones where we'll repair two ends with a plate and screws or other techniques. Well, studies have shown time and time again that it's a far easier recovery and more predictable return to sports and other activities simply by excising the small fragment of bone which hasn't healed. And this is a um, time-tested technique which has allowed athletes and uh, weekend warriors alike to return to the field and return to activities without pain. But uh, thanks again for uh, um, listening to our talk on uh, racket and golf injuries, and uh, we'll turn things over to our next talk.